Hi friends, Fred Price here. I need your help. Ever Increasing Faith Television has been on the air for approximately 30 years. From all of the reports that we've received in, it has been a blessing to multitudes of people around the world. In 2009, the Federal Communications Commission is requiring that all television broadcasts be broadcast in what's called a digital format. Up till now, it has been what's called analog. In order to do that, we're going to have to change all of our television cameras, all of our equipment that produces the program, and we have to do it instantly. Well, we don't have that kind of reserve funds as such, so I need your help. We have approximately 150,000 plus people on our mailing list. We have another 33,000 people of that amount that give on a regular basis, and then we have approximately 10,000 people who are what's determined as faith partners who have made a commitment monthly to support the program to a certain amount of money. Now, I realized that some time ago, some of you received a letter that indicated that the amount of money we needed for this changeover was $500,000. Unfortunately, that information went out before all the figures were in. And so since that time, we realized that $500,000 would not do the job. Thus, we need the $1.5 million. So what I'm asking you to do, if you'd be willing to make a one-time, over and above whatever you're already giving to support the program, just a one-time $10 gift. If everyone on our mailing list would give $10 over and above, we would have the amount of money that we need to do this that we're required to do. So I'm asking you to pray about it, think about it, I've given you the fact, the information. If the program is valuable to you and you think it should remain on the air, I'm asking you to consider this project. If so, I stand in agreement with you right now for the return on your giving. You will be planting good seed into good ground. Thank you so very much. I'll see you on the tube. Join with us today in support of our digital upgrade with a love gift of $10 or more by calling 888-800-6683. That's 888-800-6683. Welcome to ever-increasing faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. I need your continued faithful financial support if ever-increasing faith television is to remain on the air in your area. On the screen is an address where you can mail your tithe offering or gift of love. Let me take this opportunity to thank you so very much for your past, your present, and whatever future support you're led to give. Remember, you are helping to make it happen. Okay, turn in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 3rd. I was uh, contemplating, meditating, and cogitating on the fact that we are about to celebrate one of the most important seasons in the Christmas calendar. Actually, it's the most important. It's the most important because I just, got, just thought about it. Now, Easter is exceptionally important, but without this one, you wouldn't have Easter. So this has to be the most important, right? So I was thinking, meditating, cogitating, what, what, would, I, what would I talk about? What should I share about? You know, it's same old, same old, same old. Everybody knows about Christmas. But, uh, you know, Peter said, in fact, let me see if I can find it right quick. Uh, let me see if I can find it right quick, because I really have bib biblical precedent for what I'm about to do. Uh, let me see, let me see. Uh, is it first Peter or second Peter? Yes, see, it's one of the Peters. Yes, second Peter. So if you have John 3.16, stick one, stick one digital in John 6, 3.16. 
and then turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll read this scripture and then I'll, I'll tell you our title. 2 Peter chapter 1. All right. 2 Peter chapter 1, if you ever say, I have it. All right, verse 12. Peter speaks and he says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you. Say, remind you. Remind. Say, remind you. Remind. Now make it personal. Remind me. Remind me. Okay. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always, not sometimes, always, of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent or physical body, to stir you up by what? Reminding you. Now, I ask this question. I'll go to the court of public opinion. If it's all right for Peter to remind us, is it all right for Fred to remind you? Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> okay, back to John 3.16. All right. So what I want to share with you is the title. I ha I'll have to do this in two parts. This is leading up to the Christmas. So by Christmas, I will have covered uh, all of it. Um, the title is Christmas. Wonderful. Colon. What's it all about? Okay. Christmas. What's it all about? It is uh, interesting to me and amazing as I have been, uh, as I've had opportunity periodically to view television and to see how everybody's on the bandwagon about Christmas. Sure. All the advertisements and, you know, all the, the commercials and all the things about Christmas. And that's, it's, it's good, you know, it's good. Christmas, Christmas is a... Um, if I, didn't, if I didn't believe in God, Christmas would make me believe in God. Amen. Just a season. That's right. That's right. Even without Jesus, without the Bible. And here's why. Because there is no other time in the year that people are affected with a sense of giving, sharing, and love like at Christmas time. It's incredible. I mean, even... Even Scrooge, you know, I mean, people that are just ordinarily cheap and chinchy and mean and all that, they just, there's something about this season that this captivates people and there's just a more of a giving spirit, if you would, than in any other time. I really like it. I really like it. And so, but we want to look at some things in reference to the person who is the foundation of Christmas, if you would. Jesus the Christ. Because without him, we really wouldn't have Christmas. We might have another holiday or something like that. But, but there's something about it. Jesus the Christ. So, here in John 3.16, we really have the heart of God revealed. And uh, you would have to hire somebody to help you misunderstand this. <laughs> Very familiar verse of scripture, but it's, it is so foundational it is so awesome in its import, John 3, 16. Now, I want to ask you to do something for me. Probably everyone in here, or 99% of you, know the verse by memory. I don't want you to quote it. I want you to read it if you don't mind. If you just, you know, humor your pastor. Put your little beady eyes on it and read it. You know, R-E-E-D, read it. Okay? All right, if you're ready, let's everybody read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that's what Christmas is all about, about giving. And the greatest giver was and is God, and the greatest gift ever given was and is Christ. Because he says, for God so Love the world. You know, we have this thing. I'm sure some of the men can relate to this, and perhaps some women too, females. But I know it used to be that, that when I was 
going with girls and things like that, you, you, you'd always find this one girl that was just, she was the one. And we would never just say, I love you. We would say, I love you so much. You remember the so, gentlemen? Any, any? All of you have amnesia, huh? You don't, you, you never, you've never said anything like that. You never put the so on there. Well, you miss half your life. But anyway, notice this. This is where, this is where it came from. For God, see, he could have said God loved the world. For God loved the world, and he gave. He said God so loved the world. That means you with your raunchy self. <laughs> mean, ornery, unfaithful, ungrateful yourself. God didn't love you. God so loved you. That's awesome. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's really the foundation of Christmas and uh, if we stop right there, we would, we would have it epitomized in a nutshell, if you would. But we want to go on and look at some other aspects of, of this gift that was given. I want to look at Jesus a little bit and, and point out some things that you perhaps know. But again, Peter said, I'm going to put you in remembrance. I'm going to remind you. So if it's okay for Pete to remind, it's okay for Fred to remind. Right? I demand equal time. All right. Go now to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Now, I am, um, let's see, how do I want to say this? How do I want to say, how should I say this? All right, let me say it like this. I'm a perfectionist, but I'm far from being perfect. Amen. I know that, so I'm not deceiving myself. Amen. But I like everything perfect, everything in place. You know, everything just like it ought to be. And uh, when it comes to the things of the Bible and things uh, that have to do with biblical principles, biblical scenarios, I like for it to be accurate. And uh, one of the things that has always just kind of irritated me over the years has been the inaccurate, unscriptural portrayal of some of the most important events in our Christian history. Christmas is one of the primary things. Um, you've seen the Christmas cards, uh, even little tabloids out in front of, sometimes in front of funeral parlors, sometimes in front of churches, and they have a little uh, mock-up of, of the manger, right. and, and they'll have uh, uh, Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and then they'll have the three wise men with the gifts in their hands. And uh, all of that is inaccurate. It's not biblical, it's, it's fanciful. And the reason I, you know, you might say, well, what's the big deal about it? Well, to me, we're dealing with something none of us have been able to touch physically. That's 2,000 years ago. Yeah, that's right. We didn't see it with our beady eyes. We didn't touch it with our hands. Well, I don't know about you, but as far as I know, at least for now, I only have one life to live. And I want to live it as a blonde. <laughs> I know that's old, but so are you. So what's, you know. Anyway, my point is, I, I only have one life to live that I'm aware of and consciously aware of. And I want to I wanna be sure that the investment that I make in my life that I give is an investment in something that's real. I don't want to get to the end and find out this was a fairy tale. Man, I could have had 99 different women. You know what I mean? I could have just burned myself out, sex on top of sex, and lies and cheating and stealing, all the rest of that kind of stuff, you know, just whatever I could get away with. Just think I missed all that thinking this was real and come to find out at the end it's not real. I would not be a happy camper. See, all I'm doing is talking to stuff you already feel until you just wouldn't say it. So don't play me. See, I already know I've been there and done that. So, you know, it's okay. It's all right. I can handle it. But uh, I want to be sure, as sure as I can be, that this is real. So anything that I find that's biblically inaccurate, I'm a suspect of it because I want to be sure, well, maybe, it's, maybe that's the way it is, and the Bible's not true. 
You know what I'm saying? So if, if, if it is biblically true, correct, then I want it, I think it should, I think that whatever I physically see ought to match this. Mm -hmm. Seem reasonable? Ought to be able to take this book and validate it. Right? right. So, the manger scene and Mary, Joseph, and the babe and the three wise men and the gifts, it's not Bible. So I would, I would ask you, after today particularly, some of you already know some of this, but after today, don't ever pick up, don't ever use a Christmas card that has that on it. Because you're just perpetuating a lie. <laughs> Ooh, you ought to see their faces. You ought to see their faces. You ought to see their faces. But that's okay. Now, I told you to turn to what? Matthew. All right, chapter 2. And we want to begin reading at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now notice the term wise men. Underline that. Wise men. Okay, well, you had it from the last time. A couple of years ago when we did it. <laughs> Amen. I'm, well, you know, if, if you're going to remind somebody, they have to already know what you're going to remind them about. Or it won't be a reminder. It'll be a revelation. Right? But it'll, it'll do you good to look at it again. And if you look at it with an open spirit and an open mind, you'll see some little different tidbits. Okay? All right? Now, so it doesn't say three wise men. It just says wise men. And the term men is a plurality. So it could be two or 200. Right? It didn't say wise man. It'd be one. It says wise men, which is plural. So it could be anywhere from two to whatever, right? So it doesn't say three. It just says wise men. Verse three, when Herod the king heard this, that is what the wise men said, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, did underline that word wise men if you didn't do it before, underline wise men, called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. In, the, in other words, when do you see this star? When did you first see this star? All right. Uh, Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. Underline the word young child. Notice it didn't say go search for the babe. A brand new baby just born, you don't call young child. Right? right. Call it baby. Bambino. Okay? Baby. But it said young child. Now, where did Herod get the idea of using the term young child? Well, remember, he called the wise men and began to question them about when did they see the star. Now, they had come from the east. So the east from Jerusalem could be all the way over to the ocean right outside Japan. That would be the far east. But it's east, right, of Jerusalem. So in those days, they didn't have rapid transit. No, they didn't have bullet trains. They didn't have freeways. They didn't have SUVs. So travel was by horse, donkey, or primarily by foot, wagon, so forth and like that. So it, it took a long time to make a journey. So obviously then, when the wise men saw the star and made their journey to Jerusalem, it wasn't a day and a half journey. It wasn't an overnight sojourn. Amen. And so Herod, by the time he questioned them, realized that this baby was now a child. Now, I don't know. Uh, I have a couple of doctors here. 
that I see. I don't know if we have any people that work with children uh, professionally. That maybe you could update me on this. When when does a baby cease to be referred to as a baby and a young child, or is there anybody can help me out? Are oh, you work with children? You used to professionally. So say that again now. Two years old is when the departure between baby and young child or child. Okay. All right. So you got that now? So two years old at least. All right. So then that means that it probably took the wise men two years to make their journey. Could have taken them two years to make their journey. Because they had probably had to stop on the way. They, you know, they had maybe had to camp, camp out. They had maybe, who knows, they might have had to grow some food and stuff like that. You couldn't carry two years worth of food. And they really didn't know how long it was going to take them to make the journey. So it, it seems reasonable in two years you could grow, a, you know, plant a crop, right? All right. Now, now, verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also, the big liar. Okay. That I may worship him also. Verse 9. When they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now, you know, I don't know how this, this star, because in the Bible, stars are also angels. They can be angels. So I don't know if this was an angel, whatever it was, it was some, something in the heavens that, that moved, that, that they could actually follow. And that by itself probably was something that just blew him away, you know, to see something up in the sky moving like that. And so it says... Uh, when they heard, verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, underline what young child again, if you haven't already done it. Underline it, young child, okay, where the young child was. Verse 10, when they, the wise men, when they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, uh oh, wait a minute. Christ was born in a manger, in a stable, not a house, stable, the manger, stable. But this is when they came into the house. So, so this wasn't the manger. So then the wise men looking at the babe Jesus with Joseph and Mary and the little donkeys and stuff around them, that's not accurate. That's bogus. That's counterfeit. That's inaccurate. That's misleading. So don't subscribe to those cards. If you have one like that, tear it up, throw it away. Get rid of it. Because it's not accurate. It's not, it's not accurate. And people already want to find out a reason for rejecting Christ. They want to find out a reason for rejecting the Bible. And all they have to do is, is put that together and find out that's not accurate. So if that's not true, what else is not true? Now everything becomes suspect. So you might think it's not important. It's irrelevant in the material, but it is very relevant. Well, let's say it like it's relative to me, relevant to me. Okay. All right. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child. There it is again, underline the word young child, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I believe without doubt this is where the three things, the three wise men came from. The assumption is that each one of them had a different gift. But that's what? What is that? I mean, that, you know, who gives you the liberty to make that kind of an assumption? All it says is just three different gifts. I mean, one, each one of them could have had three, the three gifts. Isn't that right? Isn't that a possibility? But that's where the three came from. Without doubt, the business because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God is love, and it can only be understood by the great act of sending his only begotten son to be the sacrifice for our sins. This love does not arise from man's nature, but is created in us by God's work. God's love is unconditional. In this DVD, Frederick Price Jr. exhorts believers to walk in love and explains why Jesus summed up all the commandments in one word, love. It's not a because of kind of love. You know, in other words, it's not I love you because you've done something for me. 
which means that if you hadn't have done anything for me, then maybe I wouldn't love you. And sometimes we tend to do that towards each other. We only release love, we only show love when something's done for us. Get your copy of God's Love Today for your love gift of $20 or more in support of this ministry by calling 800-927-3436. Is healing for all? Is it God's will for all His children to be well? Does God afflict some with sickness to teach them a lesson? Why is it that some receive healing and others don't? All those people that Jesus healed were sinners. They were not Christian. They had never been born again. And yet, every one of them got healed. Every one. Now you tell me that people that didn't even have a covenant as good as mine could get healed and I can't? There's something wrong with that picture. Is healing for all? Jesus thought so, and so will you. I would ask the question again, is healing for all? My answer is, according to the Bible, yes. Get this awesome book for your love gift of $7 or more toward the ongoing work of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Call or write today. God instituted the family unit in the book of Genesis, and it remains his most sacred institution to this day. The relationship between husbands and wives, between parents and children, nothing is more precious in his sight. How could you be a more effective husband? How can you be a more godly wife? What should parents and children expect from each other? Dr. Frederick Casey Price reveals the answers in The Christian Family. No one tells it like Dr. Frederick Casey Price. Based on the Word of God and over 50 years of pastoral experience, he clearly defines the roles of family members and offers insight on how to live at today's Christian family. Get this awesome teaching on 20 CDs for your love gift of $99.95 or more. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. The Christian Family. Call or write today. All right. Verse 10, or verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and let and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So, my point is that the wise men did not necessarily constitute three. Could have been two up to who knows how many in order to be plural, correct? They never came to the manger. They never came to the stable. They never saw the donkeys and they never saw the baby, Jesus. They saw a young child who was probably playing with his Xbox. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Why not? Hey, he's probably watching a flat screen TV, <laughs> playing his games. He was a child, not a babe. What is this? Oh, all right, I ain't mad. Thank you, man. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, let's go to Luke's gospel and look at another account. Again, to me, it's important that, these, that the issues be validated, that they are true. Right. Amen. See, I want to I find out a reason why I can reject Jesus. I want to find out a reason why I can reject the Bible. Amen. So I look at it investigatively. I want it to be really, I want it to be true, but I want to be personally, I've got to cover all the bases where there might be some things that have been presented traditionally that don't line up with the scriptures. Because I only got one life to live, and I told you I want to live it as a blonde. Okay, I, I ain't got no time to be messing around. So I want to be sure as I can be that, that I'm following something that's for real. I mean, we are, we're taking it all by faith anyway. But by the, same faith, by the same token, rather, faith has to be based on something. Amen. Faith doesn't just, you don't just have faith in a vacuum. It has to be something that it's attached to, to give it credibility for you to make a commitment to follow it. Are you still here? Yes. All right. Now, Luke's gospel. If you haven't seen it, chapter 2, if you haven't seen it, I have it. All right. 
uh, beginning with verse 1. Now, after Jesus... I'm sorry, I'm back in... Um, uh, I'm still in Matthew. I told you to go to Luke, but I didn't get it yet myself. But I'll be there shortly if you'll just have a little patience with your pastor. It, it won't take me long. I, I will be there. Chapter 2, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Number one right there. Let you know she had more children. Because you don't say firstborn. Unless you had a secondborn, thirdborn, fourthborn, etc. So that lets us know she had more children. Now, I don't mean any unkindness by what I'm getting ready to say. Again, I'm a stickler for the truth to the extent I can know it. I know I don't know everything. I'm on a pursuit of it. Hot pursuit of all the truth that I can get. Okay? So I, gotta, I can only give you what I have right now. Tomorrow, if I know more, next time I see you, I'll give you more truth. But right now, I can only give you what I know. Okay? So I'm getting ready to say something. And, and I don't mean any unkindness with this statement. But again, to try to be as accurate as I can biblically. Now, normally, in, in biblical context, virgin meant a young maiden, and like we usually think of it, usually a person is not married, hasn't been sexually approached, okay? So once a woman has a baby, she is no longer in the same class as a virgin. Would you agree with that? Doesn't mean she's a bad person, but she's not, no longer classified as a virgin. Huh? Okay. Now, there are those today, 2,000 years later, that still refer to her as a virgin. There's something wrong with that picture. In my mind. She is not a virgin. That doesn't take anything away from her. I can, I can no longer call Betty Price Miss Ms., whatever these new terms are. She misses. It, it would be inaccurate to refer to her as Ms. Will you agree with that? She's married, 50-some years married. She's far from being Miss or Ms. That wouldn't be accurate, would it? Well, Mary is no longer and has not been since the birth of Jesus a virgin. So why do we still call her a virgin? Now, while I'm at it, I might as well just go ahead and throw a great big old rock in the boat and rock the sucker good. We are still seeing, we're still, they're still referring to him as baby Jesus. He is not a baby. He was, but he's not now. Just like you were, but you're not now, even though you're acting like a baby. <laughs> I didn't call any names. Amen. Okay, all I'm saying, why do you still call him a babe? He's not a baby. Yeah, we still refer to him as a, we still keep it in, to me, an unrealistic arena. He's not a baby. He's a full-grown man. She's not a virgin. Just like Betty is no longer a Miz, but that don't take anything away from her. I mean, didn't, that doesn't take anything away from her. She's no less now than she was before. She was called that, right? But she's a married woman. If you're a married woman, you're not a virgin anymore. Amen. <laughs> don't look at, at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> we want to be real. Okay. All right. Now, where was I before I was so... All right. Uh... 
All right, let's go to verse 5. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. So that means she not only, didn't, not only did she have more children, she had another son. At least. See, she had, if it had said firstborn child, then that would leave it open. Firstborn son meant she had a, at least another son. Right? Y'all are hard case today. Okay. Verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room at Motel 6. <laughs> they didn't leave the light on. Okay. Why? Because there was no room where? In the inn. Not a house, but a manger, which is a stable. Now, verse 8, now there were, there were in the same country shepherds, underline the word shepherds. Not wise men, shepherds. You see the word shepherds? Okay. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Say all people. All people. Okay, say all people. All people. Say this. Wait till I say it. Say this. I am a people. So if it's going to be great joy to all people, then it's going to be great joy to me. So it is going to be great joy to all people, then it'll be great joy to me because I be people. Right? Okay. Now, um, where I was verse 11 to all people verse 11 for there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord verse 12 and this will be the sign to you you will find a babe not a young child you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, not in a house. Okay? Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill, or peace rather, goodwill toward men. Verse 15. So it was when the angel had gone away from them, into heaven that the shepherds, they she, underline the word shepherds, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has revealed or made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the young child. Babe. And the young child? Babe. babe. And the babe lying not in a house, in the manger. So all those tabloids and all those cards are all unscriptural. And for me to participate in them is to perpetuate a lie. It is to misrepresent the book. Because we just read it, it's pretty plain. You would have to hire somebody to help you misunderstand it and pay them overtime. It's pretty plain. Difference between a manger and the house. Difference between the babe and the child. Right? All right. Uh, verse 17. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now, 
Now, let's look at some things about who Jesus really was. Come on now. Because I think some of the things that, that, that tradition has put on him has taken him out of reality. In other words, assumptions were made about him traditionally. I mean, give it a rest. If you go and look, go and look at some of the art, uh, sacred art, you see Jesus with a halo around his head. Where the heck did the halo come from? What is that all about? So then you get this, you get this idea of, of Jesus walking about a foot off the ground, feet never touching the ground, just kind of floating along with this, with this golden ring around his head. That's not in the Bible. So why do we want to perpetuate that? It gives a false, to me, it gives a false presentation of who he really was. Amen. Now, I'm going to, if I see that clock, I'm going to say a few things that probably for some of you, at face value, it will be sacrilegious. <laughs> but you know, give me some credit. Just a little credit. I don't want a lot of credit. But, but give me a little credit for having a little bit of sense. Not, not much sense, but, but a little sense. Because really, I had to have some sense to trick you into coming here and hearing me. I'm not here listening to you. So I don't know who got the most sins, me or you. So we won't even debate that issue. But I may say some things, but I ask you only for this. I ask you to hear me out before you make a value judgment. Do like the Berean Christians. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and search the scriptures to see if those things were so. So, but if you don't receive something, you can't examine it. Right? You got to get it in your little hot hand so you can put it under the microscope and check it out. So you have to receive it. They did, it didn't say they believed it, it said they received it. And then they searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. I think it's important, critically important, to see Jesus in true light. Not as some fictitious character that, that man has come up with, but to see him in his biblical presentation, which may be far different from the tradition. Now, I'm not against tradition as being against tradition, but I am against tradition that does not give me truth. Amen. You know, tradition just means something's always been done that way. But there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's been done correctly. But it had, if it has been done incorrectly, then I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm dropping that tradition fast into the garbage disposal. <laughs> Amen. All right. So, so you got to promise me, raise your right hand. Say, Pastor Price. Pastor Price. I promise. I promise. That I will receive. That I will receive. Not necessarily. Not necessarily believe, believe. But at least receive. Believe. Until you have finished. Until you have finished. Then. And only then will I make my value judgment. Okay, Lord, you heard him. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. Jesus, the Christ, was not born spiritually perfect. What? There you go. There you go. You got to read the whole book. Don't read three paragraphs out of a 90 chapter verse and then a 90 ch a chapter book and think you got it. Read the whole book, then make a judgment, right? Okay, what did I say? I said Jesus was not born spiritually perfect. He was not born spiritually perfect, complete, or mature. What did I say? What did I say? Jesus is not born I can't hear you. I didn't hear that. I need to hear it again. I'm joking. 
Okay, he was not, listen to what I said now. He was not born spiritually perfect, complete, or mature. But rather, he was born spiritually and morally innocent. What did I say? Okay, put the whole thing together. What did I say? <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> That's the reason why most of you miss 90% of what we end up teaching you because you do not take notes. You think you can remember it. I've done it myself. I knew I could remember that, smart as I am. Lord have mercy. <laughs> 15 minutes later, say, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> what? You, need to, you, know, you need to take notes and or certainly you need to buy the CD. I mean, that's if you're interested. If you're not interested, you wasted your time coming in the first place. Well, I won't say that. You didn't wait, you heard some good music. Got to, you, you got to, uh, to, to participate in the offering. You got to dance a little bit, jump, shout, and holler, and raise your hands. You know, that was, that's, that, you know, that's worth something. But you want to get this. I said Jesus was not born spiritually perfect, complete, or mature, but rather spiritually and morally innocent. Jesus is referred to, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. Jesus was referred to. 1 Corinthians 15, if you please. Oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, if you haven't seen, I have it. All right, verse 45, 45. And so it was, and so it is written, the first man, Adam. The first man, what? Adam. Became a living being, or actually a living creature, really it should be. The last Adam. Not the first Jesus, but the last Adam, who was Jesus. But notice how the Spirit of God refers to him. But the last Adam, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Because Jesus gives life, spiritual life. That's why God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because Jesus gives that everlasting life. Notice he's referred to as the last Adam. Not the first Jesus, although he was the first Jesus, <laughs> the only Jesus. Uh, you know, from our, from our perspective. But he was, he was called, he's called by the Spirit of God, the last Adam. Why? Why wasn't he called the last Fred? Why, why wasn't he called the last James? Why wasn't he called the last Peter? You know, I mean, that's a good question, valid question, but he's called Adam. Why would the Spirit of God associate Jesus with Adam? Reason being because both of those men represented the entire human race. They stood at a position to affect the human race positively or negatively. They were representative figures. They stood at the fountainhead of mankind and their choices would forever affect all humanity. Every nation, every people, every tongue, every culture would be affected by them. So Jesus is placed in juxtaposition to Adam because he was a representative person. His life, his actions would impact the entire human race. Just like Adam's did. You see, Adam was not created perfect morally or spiritually perfect. He was created innocent. 
He was created innocent. So because he was innocent, he could go either direction. If he was perfect, how, how does somebody perfect sin? How can perfection do wrong? That's why it's referred to as perfect because it's flawless. Would you agree? Can't make any mistakes. But Adam made a great big error in judgment. Would you agree with that? And his action affected all humanity for all time. So Jesus is associated with him just like I'm associated with, out, with about quitting because I'm out of time. Just think about it. I'm out of time. Stay right where you are. If this message has been a blessing to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette, CD, VHS, or DVD of the message which you've just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember again that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible <laughs> by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on compact disc or DVD. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen and join us again on Ever Increasing Faith, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life. I'm Mike Lynch, and this is my wife, Becky Lynch. Uh, we've been married for 27 years. We've been together for 33 years in total. Green Talk Christian Center has been tremendous in um, helping us with our marriage. Our marriage was in trouble, uh, largely because of uh, selfish decisions that I made. By the time it got to the point that we didn't know what to do. We had, had we had three children, we had a mortgage, we had, you know, a dog, a cat, and a frog, everything. Uh, there wasn't anything left to do. I actually drowned myself in the word. I mean, tapes, books, meetings, um, any, any access I had. I take a large responsibility for the position we were in. Uh, I did not grow up in the word of God. Uh, as a youngster, and when we got married, I was still living the same life that I was living prior to our marriage. Uh, besides our marriage being turned around, we have a relationship that is storybook now. We are best, best friends. Um, the partnership, um, the, uh, we've come full circle financially, now we attempt, our goal is to be the biggest givers. Uh, the, the achievements that we've made in raising our children, awesome. Ever increasing faith is invaluable. Uh, it's priceless uh, in that you can, you have 24 hour access um, to the Word of God, uh, either through uh, the television uh, ministry, the internet, um, there's books and tapes available online. Uh, we totally believe and agree that without the word, it's basically impossible to have a 100% fulfilled marriage and family. I just, I think that there's no, no bones about it. Television, radio, publication. For years, you've been able to receive the anointed teachings of Dr. Frederick Casey Price through all of these mediums. Now you can access them via the Internet. Visit the ever-increasing Faith Ministry Cyber Store online at www.faithdome.org and purchase whatever you want, whenever you want, both safely and securely. Browse through all of Dr. Price's awesome teachings at www.faithdome.org and experience fast, convenient, and secure shopping wherever you are. Log on today at faithdome.org. Life should be one of victory, peace, joy, and prosperity. Jesus paid an awesome price for God's people to enjoy the abundant life. So the question is, why do so many Christians fail 
Enjoy the abundant life. In this two-disc DVD set, Dr. Price explores the areas that hinder the believer, God's primary method of financing the kingdom, and the outcome of someone who does what God's Word says. Get your copy today for your love gift of $40 or more in support of this ministry by calling 800-927-3436. Call today. God deals the measure of faith to every person who hears the gospel and accepts Christ as Lord. When facing difficult situations or attempting to obtain the promises of God, we must know that everything in the kingdom of God is activated by faith. In order to receive the maximum benefit from God's kingdom, you must understand how the faith principles operate. In How to Develop Your Faith, Dr. Price takes you through a process to help pinpoint your level of faith. So that tells me that faith is you can't get away from it. It says without it, it's impossible to please God. So, you know, if you can't please the man, do you think you're going to trick him into answering your prayer? I don't think so. We all start with the same measure, and how you finish is up to you. Call today to get this six-disc CD set for your love gift of $50 or more in support of this ministry by calling 800-927-3436. 800-927-3436. True Christianity is living by God's Word, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Some believe that to be a Christian is something you are born into. The Word without action has no effect. In this six-disc CD set, Dr. Price offers practical applications and biblical illustrations of how faith is put into action. Peter said, man, we fished all night. We haven't caught a thing. Nevertheless, at your Word, not at my understanding, not at my that which makes sense, but at your word, I'm going to let down the net. And when he did it, they couldn't even contain all the fish. They couldn't even contain all the fish just by a, an act of obedience. That's all it takes. Get your copy of Faith is Acting on the Word today for your loved gift of $50 or more in support of this ministry by calling 800-927-3436. Wisdom from Above, Volume 2, Grow in Godliness, the latest release from Dr. Betty R. Price. This practical resource establishes how to grow in God's wisdom and understand just how important it is to our everyday lives. She candidly discusses such topics as living single, honoring God and your spouse, sex, parenting, interracial marriage, and health. Find wisdom that is relevant to your life. Get your copy of Wisdom from Above, Volume 2, for your love gift of $25 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. A companion CD set of Dr. Betty's related teachings is also available. Call 800-927-3436 for more information and get your copy today. next time on Ever Increasing Faith. Now we want to find out a little bit about Jesus the man. Who was he? Because portrayals show him walking about a foot off the ground, his feet never touching the ground, a halo around his head, untouched like he never touched the ground or anything like that. All that's phony baloney. That is not Jesus. Produced by Ever Increasing Faith Ministries and you, our faithful friends and partners in this area. Thank you. Call 323-758-3777 or visit our website at faithdome.org.